May we stand together. I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone else who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him, who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. If we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it says, so says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Your music this morning can be found in the yellow booklet, spiral bound booklet, the Alleluia 3, as we continue with this morning's service. Number 104.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death, brought life and immortality to light, grant that your servant John, being raised with him, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory. Who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on this day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he may save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, or powers, or depths, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. May we stand together for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. This morning we're honored to have Charlie come and share family remembrance of us. Good morning. Good morning. 
before I get started, let me say a little short prayer. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, because you are my strength and my redeemer. And one little special request, Lord, let me get through this without passing out. <laughs> it may happen. <laughs> I get the privilege of talking about my sweet brother, John Rawls Halford. I guess the best way to start is in thinking about this, four words came to mind. John was blessed, beloved, rich, and brave. Now, almost everybody here, of course, knows John. Most people probably called him John Ross or John. But personally, I had a few other little nicknames. <laughs> In fact, I don't think I ever called him John Ross. He was John, or J.R., or John Bird, or J. Bird, or Johnny Boy, or John Boy. But then others called him Dad. Others called him Big Papa. And Madison here, the best, he, she called him Big P. <laughs> it's really hard to know where to start because John's life was so full with so many people in his life and so many relationships uh, he, it, that he was blessed in that regard. He played so many life roles with so many of us here. Everyone here has a relationship with John and has had one. The thing about John is he excelled in all relationships. He was a husband. He was a brother. He was a cousin. He was a father. He was a grandfather. He was a great grandfather. He was an uncle. He was a great uncle, a son-in-law, a father-in-law, a brother-in-law, a neighbor, a friend. He was a fisherman. He was a cook. He was a hunter. He was a golfer. <laughs> And a traveler. He was an entrepreneur, which means he was a business leader. He was a manager. He was a worker, a buyer, a salesman, a collector. He was a race car fan. And last but certainly not least, he was an Alabama football fan. <laughs> but regardless of what name we use to talk about John, it was always out of love and respect. John, by his very essence, asked for, received, and gave back love. That was his being. You couldn't be around John without feeling that love. John reminds me a little bit of Peter in the Bible, um, who was the brother of Andrew, you may recall. Because Peter and John, our John, were both decisive. If you recall, Peter was a fisherman and Jesus came along and told them where to throw the nets. And Peter said, Lord, we've been fishing all night. We were worn out. But if you tell us that what we need to do, that's what we'll do. So they did. They rode out, put the net on the other side of the boat, and of course, I hope you know the rest of the story. The boat was so full of fish it almost sank. The other thing is, when Jesus said, follow me, Peter didn't argue, he didn't debate, he didn't take a vote, he simply dropped everything and followed Christ. The other thing that reminds me between, or reminds me of John and, and Peter somewhat like 
They both lived and were connected to water. Peter was a fisherman, which meant he was a boatman, which meant he was a boat repairer, which meant he was a net maker and a net repairer. He was a fish cleaner and he was a fish merchant. And finally, but not last, I would say he was a disciple, which means he was a preacher, a teacher, and a writer. Jesus called Peter his rock, mainly because he knew that he could count on him. And like our John, we could always count on him. No matter what the situation was, no matter what the issue was, no matter what the debate was, no matter what was going on, we could approach John and he would tackle whatever it needed to be tackled. Several years ago when I moved back, I'd been gone for about 30, 30 years and I suddenly realized that people didn't know me. I'd been gone for 30 years. So um, I had to kind of establish my identity in Baldwin County again. So I was constantly going to John for advice. Who do I talk to? Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Who should I give business to? Um, and he always gave me sage advice. And when I would meet with someone, whether it was a vendor or a whatever, a builder or whatever I was looking for, I learned very quickly to start out with saying, I'm John House's brother, Charlie. <laughs> that way, they knew me. And that went on for at least five years that I wasn't Charlie Hauser. I was John Hauser's brother, which suited me just fine. <laughs> John told me who to do business with and who not to do business with. And a couple of times that I didn't listen, I paid dearly. <laughs> I wish you had been a little more out of it, John. But we are where we are. In short, over those several years, I met hundreds of people that knew John, and without exception, as soon as I would say, I'm John Hauser's brother, they would light up and ask how John's doing. What's he up to? How's he doing? And they always said, basically, if you're John Hauser's brother, tell me what you need. Tell me what to do. Tell me what needs to be accomplished. And we'll get it done. In the end, with hundreds of people here, every one of us has a relationship with John, and all of it is about respect. And isn't that, in the end, what we're all looking for? The proof is right here. This chapel is full. Parish hall is full. I suspect there's people standing up. I haven't seen that, but I suspect that. And in the end, it's not about money or fame or any of that. It's all about love and respect and having a relationship with the people that you love. I'm not going to say anything that um, will surprise you, but. All else, John was absolutely loved, adored, blessed, and rich. John was brave. It's no secret that John was ill for a long, long time with multiple illnesses, multiple maladies that would put most people down, period. But in all these many years, John never complained. He never said, woe is me, or why me, Lord? Well, this is not fair. I never heard him utter any words like that. He had every excuse to be bitter, every excuse to be upset with his life from a physical standpoint. 
but he wasn't. He lived life to the fullest and he could always, always generate that beautiful smile that would light up a room. Even in the hospital, it said that when people would go again, if he was awake, he would smile. I think John would like this passage. It's from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you, paraphrasing by the way, finally all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers and sisters. Be compassionate and humble. That a bit about it, John. So in closing, I want to thank John. Thank you, John Rosehausen, for being who you were, for being the wonderful person that we all fell in love with, that we all loved and respected. You enriched our lives beyond words, beyond any expectations. Yes, we're going to miss you. The hole in my heart like yours is huge. But I always gravitate back to the fact that we know where John is. He's in paradise. He is well. His body is sound. He's happy. And he's with relatives preceded him. In the end, I thank John not only for being who he is, but teaching us what it meant to have that beautiful, beautiful smile. May we stand together and sing. Number 11 in the yellow book.
on behalf of St. Paul's Chapel and on behalf of John's family, I'd like to thank you for being here. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times at events like this one that we have the honor of attending today. You see people that you haven't seen in way too long and you always hear it. It's so good to see you. I'm sorry it had to be under these circumstances. We should really get together more often. And then we go our separate ways and we keep on seeing the people that you usually see and not seeing the people that you don't usually see. We're creatures of habit. We, we get in a rhythm of life and we just put our noses to the grindstone and take care of business and it takes an unusual event like this to sort of stop us in our tracks and slow down and see one another for a second. We start to remember what's most important in life, like Charlie said, relationships, being with each other in the good times, yes, but especially especially in the hard times. Comforting words only go so far, and the simple presence of a friend or a loved one says and does more than words ever could. From the perspective of somebody who works in ministry, I see these moments come and go a lot, more often than the average person, and it's one of the best parts of the job to be honest with you. You get to be present for the most joyful experiences and the most difficult parts of people's lives. And in the midst of it all, you start to recognize how God is truly present with us in the arms of the ones who hold us when we fall apart. In the smiles of those who rejoice with us. And in the tears, people cry with us when we're weighed down with sorrow. In a world that is so desperate for just a little bit of hope, the thing we seem to most often overlook is that God is with us most powerfully when we are with each other in solidarity and in love. That's how we experience God's hope for here and for now. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in, these, these bodies, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Sometimes it's easy to see the hope that's far off in the sweet by and by. But what if we thought about that from the perspective that Jesus often used when he talked about something God was building here among us now? He called it the kingdom of heaven. It was never something for Jesus that was located far away or in the distant future. It was always that Jesus described it as a present reality alive and at work in the world in this moment. Through the incarnation of Jesus, through his love and his ministry, and, his, and just a, in a very basic sense, his presence, the kingdom of heaven became a reality and is still a reality on earth. I'm a big proponent that heaven starts here and now as we participate in this thing we call life. And that sort of life becomes real, most real in how we care for each other. How we show up for each other and how we love our fellow human beings, whoever they may be. I only met John and Amanda over the past three months or so. And almost instantly, I felt a kindred connection with them. It's like I'd known them for a long time. 
If there's one thing I experienced as I got to know John, it's that he knew how to love in the moment. He knew about the love of the good shepherd that we read about today. I know he knew about that love because that's exactly how John lived. Always willing to sacrifice for his sheep. Right to the end, he was surrounded by love and he gave it back as strongly as he was given it. And all the more intensely as his health declined. The courage it takes to keep your heart open like that, even when you know your time is limited, is one of the most inspiring things I think I've ever seen. Never mind dying. I mean, living like that is hard enough. Especially when we're faced with difficult situations. Keeping your heart open in life means that you risk getting your heart broken in a hundred different ways. And that is scary. And Second Corinthians, again, nails, nails it. For while we are still in this tent... We groan under our burden because we wish not to be uncovered, but to be clothed, completely consumed in our eventual heavenly reality. And I love this phrase. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life, true life, heavenly life, abundant life. Sometimes I think about these little short lives that we live like skipping a rock across the water. We get hurled out into the world and we start skipping along pretty fast and pretty far at first. And then as we get older, we get slower and shorter skips until at last we sink down into the water, into that beautiful, mysterious deep love that awaits us. The bottom line is, folks, nobody can beat mortality. It's something we all have to face. And in times like these, we come directly face to face with it. And while we can't beat our mortality, because all of us are children of God and beloved, we can know that our entire lives, whether we know it or not, whether we feel it or not, are skipping along on the grace and the love of God. And when our skips run out, we get swallowed up by that same grace and love we've been riding on all this time. That's the love that John knew about. True, abundant, life-giving love that swallows us up when our time on earth runs out. So don't wait. Don't wait to show people that you love them. Lean into love. Life is so much sweeter that way. When we do finally face our own mortality, I think being swallowed up by love will feel far more familiar than we ever imagined. Amen. May we stand together the assurance of eternal life given in baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father of the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers of the people. For our brother John, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for John, and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. You raised the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Lord. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother John. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Father of all, we pray to you for John and for all those who whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May John's soul and the souls of all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more. Neither sign, but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed to the earth, and to earth we shall return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant John. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, the lamb of your own flock, sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company the saints in light. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, may we stand for the blessing. The blessing, the love, the peace, the hope, the joy of God, the Father Almighty, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Amen. 42 in the yellow book. <laughs>
Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is indeed. Alleluia, alleluia. You are dismissed.